many of us have touched states of transcendence. In fact, all of us do, but most of us, as I said before, have structures that lead to denying them. And once we've touched them, our lives are different. Once we acknowledge we have touched them and not reject them out of hand. Once you have recognized that there are other realities other than the one that you have been familiar with, your life starts to change. I don't care whether you got it from a joint, whether you got it from meditation, whether you got it from sex, whether you got it from trauma, whether you got it from uh, surfing or whatever. Whatever thing you did that took you beyond yourself, you could have taught it from religious ecstasy in temple or church. You could have gotten it in a, a thousand different ways. Whatever it was, if you acknowledged it as, as real as what you started from, you are on the way. That is what's known as awakening. From the moment you have awakened, that is, you acknowledge the fact that you are more than you think you are and that the universe is different than your conceptual structure has it to be. From then on, the rest of your life is all the grist for the mill of awakening. It's all that process that the awakened awareness uses the stuff from then on in order to get free. It's all the journey to freedom from then on. And you literally cannot fall off the path. You can think you fell off the path, which many people do. They say, oh, I lost it. I blew it. I used to be so high. Whatever spiritual gains you make from moment to moment are yours if they are real gains. If you just have them like a, something you're holding on to, you can lose them. But the basic journey is a journey of the awakening. You don't, the thing is, you can't go back to sleep once you start to awaken. You can appear. You know how you try to go back to sleep because you went, woke up before the alarm clock? <laughs> and you lie there and you try to go back to sleep. I mean, it's even more horrible than that. Because when you were asleep, you could milk your melodramas for all they were worth. You could trip out on stuff. Will it? Won't it? Can I? Can I? Should I? Shouldn't I? Did he? Didn't he? And afterwards, you just see yourself doing it. There he goes, milking the drama again. And you want to milk it some more. That's the problem. I mean, this is shorthand conversation. Some of you will understand it. You really want to milk it. You really want to get lost back into the drama. You want to be back in the romanticism of life. Because the predicament is that something dies in you when something new is born. And what dies in you is a certain old style of taking your ego so seriously. You just can't quite get into it quite with the same verve you used to be able to, you know. So what we are about is a process of transformation then that happens and it is a road that is just like this. It's highs and lows and depressions and elations and now you got it and now you lost it and you grab something and then it just turns into more spiritual materialism and it turns into nothing. And you just watch this process and you see that in the late 60s, a lot of people in early 70s, a lot of people got what I call phony holy. They intellectually saw where they wanted to be and then they imitated it as if they were that. It's like imitating the Buddha or imitating the Christ or imitating Mother Teresa or whatever or Ananda Mai Ma. Or and the fraudulence of that, because we in the West are used to our intellect, leading with our intellect. So we see where we want to be and we imitate it and then pull ourselves into it. <clears throat> the fraudulence of that leads to a reaction. <clears throat> and you found the same people who you saw first in white with big smiles and doing beads and very holy. See them a few years later at the local bar. Now, saying, oh, that was all crap. Uh, it was all, you know, I was off my mind. That was a cult. I'm done with that stuff. And now we got to deal with the real things of the world. 
And they say, I, I gave it up, but all they're doing is going through another part of the process. See, there's no way out of it once you start. That's the problem. I often feel like saying people don't start. <laughs> See, I mean, it's too late for you already. I'm sorry, because you're here and you already, you, you already know too much. See? <clears throat> A great story of a little boy that's being chased in Central Park and I read it in the New Yorker, and uh, this other kid says to him, is chasing him, and the other kid's big, and the little kid starts to climb up a tree. Big guy's climbing up, and the little kid says, I'm making you climb this tree. Big guy says, no, you're not, and he keeps climbing. He says, I'm making you climb the tree. No, you're not. I'm not going to climb the tree. So the big guy gets down, starts to walk away, and the kid says, I'm making you walk away. He yells from the tree. Big guy says, no, you're not. And as the big boy walks out of the park, the little boy yells, and everything you do for the rest of your life, I made you do. <laughs> and that's the predicament. Once you've started, everything from here on for the rest of your life is part of this journey of awakening. Now, where does it fit in relation to all the other things of your life? Children, for example, jobs, pleasures, pains, death. See, is it an also ran? Is it another one of them? Well, I'll do death on Tuesday and then I'll work on awakening on Wednesday or I do awakening Sunday mornings. That's when we worry about awakening. Unfortunately, it takes it over. One by one, all of those things come under this until finally you are working to awaken. You say, well, what about service to other people? Well, look at how that works. If I want to help you out of your suffering, say you're hungry, the way I feed you will determine whether the suffering of your belly is, is alleviated or whether I also simultaneously relieve the root suffering of your separateness. Any act between two human beings can be an act which draws the people closer together into unity or it's divisive. It's the same way as I said about this lecture. If I'm identifying as being the lecturer, you must be the audience. If I'm standing outside of the lecturing and lecturing, you can stand outside of the audience and audience and we are meeting here and we're dancing this way. And the action brings us closer together. Now, since I know that, and I want to, when I feed somebody, I not only want to feed their belly, I want to feed their spirit. I realize that in order to relieve the suffering of other people, I have to work on myself in order that I am not trapped in my own stuff. So that I end up working on myself as an act of compassion for other people. And then you say, well, can you sit around working on yourself when other people are suffering? It's not an either-or proposition. Because as you and I quiet down to hear what we're doing here on earth, what's the meaning of our incarnation? And we listen to the forms through which we must express, through which we must work, what's been handed to us, what's on our plate then we act and if somebody walks up and they're hungry that's what's on our plate at that moment if you have a child that's crying that's on your plate at that moment to say like some woman came up to me once and she said you know if it wasn't for the kids I could really do some heavy spiritual work okay. can you hear what she's caught in the kids are her spiritual work. She just hasn't figured out how to use it as her vehicle. The game is you take what's on your plate and you use it through which to become free. So in the, if somebody is starving, in the process of feeding them, that is the vehicle you use to work on yourself to extricate yourself from being identified with being the feeder. Is that too complex? Or can you hear that one? See, what I saw was that there was no way not to be an actor as long as you're in an incarnation. You can't not do anything. Which thing are you not going to do first? 
you know? I'm just going to sit in bed. Well, that's doing something. See? You can't not do anything as long as you're in a form. Forms do things. And then the question is, which form will you do? Which action will you do? Now, when you fully understand that your incarnation is a vehicle for liberation, and that's what your business is on earth, as pure and simple as that, and as uncompromising as that, then the answer to which one should I do comes out of a place where it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter other, out of any other reason. It, it doesn't matter so much that you can be quiet to listen. The statement is, truth waits. This is from the Tao Te Ching. Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. That it is only when there is quietness inside you that you can listen to hear what part you play, what your unique role is in the game. And no role is better than any other role. Whatever you're doing in your life is no better or worse than what I'm doing in my life. It's just different. And each of us has a unique route through. And the art isn't to imitate somebody else's route, but to listen to hear our own route. Because it is in your fulfilling your form perfectly that you're free. When you push away part of yourself or grab something, you're not free. You're trapped by it. You're trapped by your own grabbing. It's like the monkey that sticks his hand in the jar to get the apple and closes his fist, and then with his fist around the apple, he can't get his hand out of the jar. And he doesn't know what to do because he can't let go of the apple. And it's the way they trap monkeys because they tie the jar to a string. And then he sticks his hand in it. He's not smart enough to let go of the apple to get his hand out, the banana. No way we can fall off the path. You can scare yourself. Oh, I've fallen off the path. But that's just more stuff. And I listen from morning till night to people caught in stuff. And my job is to help them see through the stuff and help them find the place behind the stuff so they can be quiet to hear how to play it out how to honor it properly, how to appreciate. These are words that are very important, words like appreciate. Look at the difference between judge and appreciate. Judging is an intellectual function. Judging is something where you've got to decide between this and that, and you're constantly judging. Isn't it interesting? You go out into the woods and you look at trees, and you appreciate trees, little gnarled trees and big tall trees and oaks and pine and elms. Each one has its own distinctive beauty and little gnarled trees have their own beauty. Everything's quite beautiful. Then you look at humans. Do you notice what happens to appreciation? It turns into judgment. As if, is short better than tall? Is fat better than thin? Is da 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 All those dimensions, suddenly it's all judging. And it's interesting to flip judging back into appreciation again. Like in our interaction with hu fellow human beings, we are constantly judging. But when you look at yourself, look at how you have unfolded. It wasn't necessarily all intentional. It's just been an unfolding process. You are what you are. You are an essence statement. If your name is David, you are an essence David at this moment. If you're Doris, you're an essence Doris. You are an essence person in the sense that it is uniquely unfolding quite beautifully. If you set aside judgment and just look at appreciation. Now look at another person. They are unfolding the way they are. Your judgment about them is cutting you off from them. But the appreciation, like somebody, you have a hard time with somebody. They're a, really, a real stinker. An essence rat. <laughs> now, do you appreciate essence ratness? I mean, they have to live inside of it. <clears throat> so you begin to see that people aren't really doing it to each other so much. You are using other people to do it to yourself. 
Other people are just being who they are. There's the rat, there's the seeker, there's the somebody wants something, there's somebody giving something, there's somebody powerful, there's somebody, and you use them mercilessly to play out your own model of yourself. And part of this process of awakening is to watch how you do this and start to accept the responsibility for the way in which you use the universe to keep doing it to yourself over and over and over again. And for that, you have to be very quiet to hear how you work. And part of what meditation is about is the technique to quiet you down so that you can begin to watch your own mind at work. And you can watch the way in which you create the stuff of the solidity of the reality of the world you live in. So one of the stances is the stance of listening, of just listening listening very carefully, listening to hear what is the fullness of this moment. Listening not just with your ears, and not listening just with your intellect, but listening with your whole being as a listening agent, listening intuitively. There is so much more information that comes into us than we process because we reduce the way we process material so well. Two people meet and they get involved and they fall in love and they get married and then later they say, I didn't know about him. <laughs> oh, why didn't you? It didn't have to be concept. The vibration was all there. All of the information. Everybody is a redundant mass of information. If you're quiet enough to hear, you would hear it all. You would know everything intuitively, not conceptually. You wouldn't know you know, but you would know. And if you were trusting the knowing, not the knowing you know, if you didn't need to know you knew, but you just needed to know, you would be able to act in a way that would keep you from being surprised all the time. Is that too much or still too much? Didn't get it? <laughs> Put it in another way, we have closed down that intuitive heart way of knowing the universe and substituted for it the intellectual way of knowing the universe, a conceptual analytic structure. So we think about everything to know whether we know it or not. And if we know each other through our minds and through our needs and through our personality, through our ego structures, we are always separate from each other. We are always like objects to each other. And the heart is never fed. There is a way. Let me talk about the heart. I'm not talking about the boom, 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 boom. I'm not talking about the anatomical heart. I am not talking about the romantic heart. The do you love me? I am talking about what in Chinese is called the sin sin, or it's called the atma, or the jivatma in Sanskrit. It is called also the intuitive heart. It is the, the place in you. When I took those drugs and went behind all the places I thought I was and I found a place where I am, that's the doorway to that place. That In that place, there is a word that I used at the beginning, namaste. Namaste is a, a very common word used in India. It means I honor the place in you where when you're in yours and I'm in mine, there's only one of us. Because when you go deep enough into you and get behind all your, all your personality and all your stuff, all your separateness, and I go back at far enough inside me, it ends up there's only one of it. You could call it awareness. You can call it any number of things. You can call it energy, lots of words for it. Part of what we're talking about is how to acknowledge that place in yourself. And then the next part of it is how do you feed it? It's the care and feeding of the intuitive heart. I mean, you must see when you walk down the street and you see somebody that is panhandling or sleeping in a doorway, the way in which you close your heart to deal with that situation most often leaves you tight. It leaves you closed down. It leaves you cut off. 
it leaves you alienated from the universe around you. And there's an anger in you that that situation demanded that you do that. And you feel safe when you're in your home and you can close the door and you feel safe to open your heart. Isn't that an interesting one? 